Hello everyone. Today I'd like to talk about Black Panther, the latest film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe of movies featuring heroes with superhuman abilities. Uh, but first of all, we need to talk about A Christmas Carol. So the main character in A Christmas Carol is, of course, Ebenezer Scrooge. And I'll show here a picture of Michael Caine in the Muppet Christmas Carol, which is by far the best adaptation. And I'd like you to be a bit of a guinea pig in a little experiment of mine right now. Uh, how would you describe the character of Ebenezer Scrooge? Now this might seem silly, uh, but it does have a point. Uh, so what is Scrooge like? Well, he's selfish, he's miserly, he's cold-hearted, unpleasant, you know, you get the picture. Hard and sharp as a flint from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. So my question is this, uh, why is this the image of Scrooge that persists? Because of course this is only Scrooge's character at the start of the narrative, but then, you know, things happen to him and he changes. A Christmas Carol is the story of how Scrooge transforms from a cold, cruel person into a generous, kind person. Yet we understand that if someone calls another person Scrooge, they're saying they're unkind and mean, rather than as good a man as the good old city knew, as Dickens describes Scrooge by the end of the story. So why is this? Well, I don't know. You know, it's just something I noticed. And maybe it's just that first impressions count a lot. You know, maybe the most memorable characters and places and things in a story just more naturally occur at the start before the narrative has a chance to smooth out the edges on its way to bringing the story to a resolution. Uh, Scrooge certainly stands out more at the start of the book than at the end. So anyway, let's seemingly abandon this point here and move on to talk about Black Panther. And fair warning, there will be spoilers in this video, uh, not just for Black Panther, but for Thor Ragnarok as well. And, well, A Christmas Carol, too, I guess. It's a bit late for that now, though. Uh, so why will there be spoilers for Thor Ragnarok in this video? Well, that's because both it and Black Panther follow a very similar story structure, which I'll just outline rather quickly here. So the main character of the story is a prince who is the heir to a kingdom. His father is the king, and in the mind of the prince, he's a great leader who the prince does not yet feel ready to replace. However, following the death of the king, the prince finds out a terrible secret about something his father did in the past, something that creates the antagonising force in the movie. In 4, Odin imprisoned his firstborn child, Hela, after she helped him conquer the Nine Realms, and in Black Panther, King T'Chaka killed his own brother and abandons his nephew, who returns later, like Hela, seeking revenge. The prince is initially defeated and depowered, Thor loses his hammer, T'Challa loses his... cat powers, and this sets them up to later return, regain their powers, defeat the antagonist, and prevent them from doing something terrible. And in the process, the prince decides he will have to radically transform his society. Thor intentionally destroys Asgard in order to defeat Hela, and T'Challa, at the conclusion of the movie, reveals the existence of Wakanda to the rest of the world. So we're here to talk about Black Panther, so why am I mentioning its similarity to Thor Ragnarok? You know, am I really trying to show off that I noticed two Marvel superhero movies were similar? Well, a little bit, uh, but it does tie into a point I want to make later. So I've teed up two different points at the start of the video here, the Scrooge thing and the Thor Ragnarok thing, and let's leave them both dangling there awkwardly and move on to answer today's apparently pressing question. Is Wakanda an alt-right ethno-state? Wakanda is the alt-right paradise, and every single inhabitant of Wakanda, with the exception of T'Challa's sister, is alt-right. Wakanda is actually almost identical to the very stereotype of what you say Trump is trying to create in America. Wakanda is homogenous. Wakanda is isolationist. Wakanda is willing to exploit its natural resources. Wakanda is protected by walls. Wakanda doesn't allow immigration. Wakanda is based around national self-interest. That's literally everything you say Trump is bad for doing, but when fictional black people are doing it, suddenly it's amazing. Wakanda is a xenophobic, high-tech, space-age ethnostate 
that does not wish to have any interaction with the outside world and is surrounded by a big beautiful wall which is guarded by a warrior class. This is word for word what Richard Spencer wants for the white race. And the king says, you know, we should maybe we should take refugees in from Africa. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. What a, what a question to ask. Should we take, we have this unified ethno state that's very powerful based upon technology and respect for our ancestors. Should we take in refugees from Africa that are black like us? And the guy's like, eh, you bring refugees in, you bring all their problems too. So no. <laughs> Jeez, I feel a bit out of the loop. You know, like there's some YouTuber newsletter I'm not receiving. It seems my colleagues across the aisle are all in agreement. Black Panther's Wakanda is an alt-right, Trumpist, isolationist, anti-immigrant ethnostate. So what we're going to do today is see which words in that sentence are true. And let's start with ethnostate, that being a state run by and for a particular ethnicity. A particular ethnicity with a single culture, language, ancestry, and so on. So is Wakanda one of these ethnostates? Well, in the opening narration of the movie intended to be watched and understood by children, it is explained to the audience that Wakanda is a confederation of different tribes of people. These tribes can assent to or challenge the rule of the king, and indeed one of the early scenes in the movie features the leader of the Jabari tribe, M'Baku, challenging T'Challa's rule. The Jabari tribe live within Wakanda but disagree with how the other tribes live and govern. They have a different culture to the rest of the Wakandans. Is Wakanda an ethnostate? No, it's made up of different ethnicities. All the YouTube racists have done in declaring Wakanda an ethnostate is betray what they really mean when they say ethnostate, which is race state. The different tribes in Wakanda are all black. So that means that even though the opening narration explains that Wakanda is a confederation of different tribes of people with different cultures and heritages, whatever, that doesn't matter. They're black, so they must all be the same, apparently. So ethnostate is out. However, Wakanda is a secretive isolationist state that hides its existence from the rest of the world behind a big wall. That's true at the start of the story, anyway, and then, like in A Christmas Carol, events occur and things change. Characters have arcs. The Wakanda at the end of the narrative is different to the Wakanda at the start, so let's take a look at these videos in more detail and see what, if anything, they have to say about that. First up is Paul Joseph Watson's The Truth About the Black Panther movie, uh, the thumbnail of which features Black Panther in a Trump hat there, for some reason. The Black Panther movie is a piece of shit. I haven't actually seen it. Oh. Well, okay, fair enough. Yeah, we'll leave that there then. That one was easy. Paul didn't even watch the movie. You know, why he feels qualified to give his opinion about the movie, having not seen it, is a bit of a mystery. Now, since he hasn't seen it, uh, this means Paul has to rely on someone else to fill him in. So Black Lives Matter are portrayed as the villains, the hero is a nationalist, the hero is basically Black Trump. Uh, that's right, Paul thinks that T'Challa is an isolationist nationalist not because he's seen the movie, but because Ian Miles Chong told him so. Always a trustworthy source of information there. So what does Paul have to say about T'Challa later revealing Wakanda to the rest of the world and using its resources to help others? Nothing, of course, because he hasn't seen the movie. Honestly. Uh, let's move on and take a peek at Stefan Molyneux's video, The Truth About Black Panther. Uh, first off, Stefan appears to have actually watched the movie, so well done, he gets a big gold star for that. And let's see what he thinks of it. The power of Wakanda is the power of, obviously, this, this magical vibranium, but also as they repeat and repeat and repeat, throughout the movie, respect your ancestors, love your ancestors, know your history, live for your people, live for your country, live for your state, live for your tribe. The tribe is everything. Wakanda forever. Whew. Powerful stuff. So the strength of a people is in its respect for its ancestors. So respecting ancestors 
is the key to Wakanda's strength. Now, I don't know what film he watched, but in my cinema, it showed the Black Panther that includes a scene in which T'Challa, the protagonist, actually meets his ancestors, the previous Black Panthers, and shouts at them, you were wrong, all of you were wrong to turn your back on the rest of the world. You know, the strict isolationism enforced by Wakanda's previous rulers is presented as a bad thing that the hero has to overcome. It creates Killmonger, the antagonist. T'Challa even outright states, Killmonger is a monster of our own making. He might as well look right into the camera when he says it as well. It's like a making sure the kids in the audience follow along moment. T'Challa's turning point in the movie is when he rejects how his ancestors ruled. He rejects isolationism and later reveals the existence of Wakanda. What does Stefan have to say about this? Well, if you guessed absolutely nothing, uh, congratulations, you're correct. Uh, Stefan actually says remarkably little about the actual movie in his 56-minute video, choosing instead to deliver his standard here's why colonialism was okay speech for about 95% of the runtime. Now, Sargon of Akkad surprises by actually mentioning the end of the movie in his video, The Politics of Black Panther. Uh, not that he actually factors it into his understanding of the rest of the narrative, however. He makes a few mistakes in that regard. So let's take a peek. His mother is the highly respected queen, and his 16-year-old sister is Wakanda's resident genius, who happens to be able to make anything she likes out of vibranium. She's also insufferable constantly sniping at him and ruining any moments of meaning that T'Challa has, while at the same time attempting to undermine his authority as king. I found her unrealistic, unrelatable, and unbearable, so I wasn't surprised to learn that her character was also a far-left open borders advocate, which T'Challa shuts down without any further discussion. He points out, correctly, that if they let people in, Wakanda will change, which was a surprisingly woke defense of anti-immigration policies. So first off, this conversation between T'Challa and his sister Shuri, the supposed far-left open borders advocate, doesn't happen. Uh, the conversation in which T'Challa says he doesn't want to let in refugees actually takes place between him and Nakia, who is his love interest in the movie. And this isn't the only time Sargon mixes up these two characters. He elsewhere states, the women of Wakanda are portrayed as strong, intelligent, and capable, but are locked out of ruling the patriarchal kingdom because of their gender, which is alluded to in a conversation between T'Challa and his sister, where he gently chastises her for suggesting that one day she might rule because she's a girl. Now, is that true? I can't remember that scene happening, honestly. I remember a scene in which T'Challa talks about Nakia being a queen because he's flirting with her, you know, if he marries her, she'll be the queen, uh, but nothing about Shuri being the queen. I'm willing to admit being wrong here, you know, maybe my memory is on the fritz as well. But regardless, Carl uses the conversation between T'Challa and Nakia as his proof that T'Challa is alt-right. He also shares a picture of Black Panther in a Trump hat. So I think I can help Sargon out a little here with my interpretation of the narrative of the film. There are a few key early scenes in the movie that relate to Wakanda's governance. Uh, first off is T'Challa meeting the spirit of his father and saying he doesn't feel ready to lead and isn't sure what to do. And then his father's spirit says, surround yourself with people you trust. And the next scene is T'Challa talking to his love interest, Nakia. He asks her what Wakanda should do, and she says, we should share our wealth and knowledge with the world and take in refugees. You know, all that good stuff. The next scene is T'Challa talking to his friend Wakabi, who advises him not to let refugees in, but says, hey, if you want to go fuck some guys up, I'm down with that. Uh, to which T'Challa rebuffs him and says, war is not our way. These scenes set up the core thematic conflict of the movie. You know, should Wakanda remain hidden or reveal itself to the world? And if it reveals itself, should that be done peacefully and diplomatically or in a violent conquest? T'Challa takes the opposite side in his conversations with both Wakabi and Nakia because he isn't sure what he should do. His first real test comes when Everett Ross gets shot. There's a conversation between Okoye, the partner of Wakabi, and Nakia where they again debate the core conflict. Should we reveal Wakanda in order to help this outsider, or should we let it remain hidden? 
and T'Challa chooses to bring him to Wakanda in order to save his life. And then later in the story, we of course have the previously mentioned T'Challa shouting at his ancestors that they were wrong, and finally using Wakanda's resources to help the world at the conclusion of the movie. So, is T'Challa alt-right? Well, only if being alt-right means abandoning those principles immediately in order to do the right thing at every available opportunity. T'Challa is hesitantly anti-immigration at the beginning of the film, but then things happen to him and he changes and by the end, he is not. It's the old Scrooge issue again. Sargon and Stefan and Paul are relaying only the initial representation of T'Challa and Wakanda, and not the narrative as a whole. Now, the rest of Sargon's response is filled with similar blustery retellings of all the terrible things about Wakanda, you know, as if he's the only one who noticed them. And I'm not really sure who he's responding to. Uh, I can take a guess, though. Uh, though it's a little convoluted to relay, so stick with me here. Sargon has seen people he calls SJWs excited about the Black Panther movie, as indeed a lot of people are. A big budget movie with a predominantly black cast set in Africa, you know, it brings some diversity to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. A lot of minorities and those on the left are glad to see the movie doing so well. But Sargon and other right-wingers see this enthusiasm about what the movie represents and misinterpret it to be uncritical and unquestioning enthusiasm for every aspect of every part of the movie. So in Sargon's head, all these SJWs are excited to see a representation of a flawless black paradise. And then when he notices that Wakanda is not so, that it's actually a country with problems that need to be overcome, he treats that as a contradiction. You know, this movie isn't living up to my expectation of SJW expectations. Aha, I have caught it out. And Carl, you're off the mark, man. You know, people are just excited to see a black superhero movie. It doesn't mean they now support hereditary monarchies or something just because there was one in the movie. I mean, I like Thor Ragnarok. That's got a hereditary monarchy in the movie. It doesn't mean I support it, though, does it? That was my Thor Ragnarok callback there. I bet you've forgotten about that. Uh, there's another one coming up in a few minutes as well, so be on the lookout. So, to demonstrate that us loony SJW types can actually look at the movie critically, uh, I guess I should give my opinions here. Uh, so, I thought Black Panther was okay. It's probably my second favourite Marvel movie after Thor Ragnarok, uh, though that is not a field with particularly stiff competition. Uh, mostly exceedingly flaccid competition, actually. All the positive things about Black Panther were held back in part uh, by the constraints of the medium. It is ultimately a comic book movie, and comes with all the problems that that entails. You know, regardless of politics, you know the final confrontation is going to be between two punch men punching each other until the good guy punches the best and wins. Now, Black Panther attempts to give the villain Killmonger some complexity, as much complexity as one can give a character called Killmonger, anyway, but it ultimately needs the audience to side with Black Panther, so it tempers that complexity with having Killmonger just do horrible things from time to time. And this good versus evil simplification bleeds into the wider conflict of the movie as well. Killmonger's was the bad way to reveal Wakanda to the world, and T'Challa's is the good way, when, really, it's more complex than that. You know, what happens if T'Challa tries to give aid to a country and they refuse? Or if the government keeps all the aid for themselves while letting their people starve, you know, will he then intervene? Or just abandon those people? It's a pretty tough question, and the movie kind of rushes past this problem at the end there. But they have to save something for Black Panther too, I guess. So T'Challa's peaceful diplomatic aid outreach thing felt a little thin to me. Now obviously, starting a race war as Killmonger wanted is hardly a perfect option either, but these two philosophies are not the only two that are available. But again, it's a Marvel movie. The closer that Black Panther gets to real-world problems and situations, the duller its edge gets. You know, it's held back by its proximity to reality, I guess. There's almost no white racism in the movie, for instance, and for a movie that references colonialism a bunch, having the conflict be between a black man and his cousin within a royal family 
at that. It felt like an imposed half measure. You know, they want this movie to sell to white audiences too, clearly. The more direct colonialist story would be the world finding out about Wakanda's vibranium deposits and invading it to plunder them, and having Wakanda have to fight back. But that story would be a little embarrassing, I imagine. Uh, this is partly why I prefer Thor Ragnarok to Black Panther, because the Thor movie, being set in a fictional space empire, has a lot more freedom to go where the story needs to. You can have Thor recognise that colonialist Asgard needs to be destroyed, and doing it, and setting out to create a better society, but you can't have Wakanda being invaded by a real country that actually exists on Earth and then have Wakanda destroy it. Though that is... Fun to imagine. The one other criticism I have of Black Panther is one I also have for Thor Ragnarok, uh, that it doesn't drop the hereditary monarchy at the end of the movie. Looking at this list again, the one and only point that remains true by the end of the movie is anti-democracy. Now, the movie does communicate that absolute monarchy is a bad thing. It means someone like Killmonger can usurp the throne and Okoye turning on King Killmonger is presented heroically, for instance, but I'd have preferred a more direct condemnation for the less discerning viewers in the audience, shall we say. You know, a little tacked-on conversation at the end. By the way, that Killmonger thing sucked, we should probably have elections instead. You know, that wouldn't have been hard to do. If I were making the sequel, uh, that would probably be the first plot point. All that said, I still enjoyed Black Panther and I'm excited about it, particularly in a sign of things to come type fashion. The more that Hollywood gets used to the idea that it does not only need to tell white stories, the more stories we'll all have to enjoy. And isn't that neat? And I guess at the conclusion here, I should return and answer the opening question. Is Black Panther alt-right? No. Thanks a lot for watching, everyone, and thank you for listening to me waffle about a Marvel movie for however many minutes this video ended up being. I decided to put this video out before my video on Charlottesville, because I wanted to take a little more time with it. But that video is nearly done, I'm happy to announce, so expect that very shortly. Thanks, as always, to my supporters over on Patreon, all of whom are brilliant. Uh, head over there and check it out if you like, and also follow me on Twitter or send me a question on Curious Cat. I will put the links below. Uh, thanks a lot, folks. I'll see you next time.